made it back to LA. We have a heck of a show planned for you. I had cold pizza for breakfast, so you know it's going to be a good one, and it is. Hack it. Breaking news to the Jets. Does Aaron Rodgers follow? We'll break down those storylines. And then it's hammer time. Matt Hamilton breaks down Patrick Mahomes and his ankle. Patrick Queen will join us. He'll be here, uh, and he knows Burrow and Chase very well. Not just three times this year, and then, of course, last year we're talking about back to the college days. And we have the much-anticipated appearance from our good friend Eric Weddle will cause quite a bit of a stir among Who Day Nation. Let's go. Let's hear it on Twitter uh, at Up and Adam Show. I like a swivel chair. We're in a bit of a makeshift studio. I've got Bills fans tweeting me, oh, you got rid of that Bills hat really quick. No, this is a green screen image. If I wore a green shirt, I'd be a floating head and I'll probably do that tomorrow. Uh, I got a swivel chair. Nobody likes a swivel chair back there in the control room for me. You guys got to change this room. I'm going to be doing this the whole show. But we do have a bit of breaking news to get you this morning in a packed show. Take a look at this. Tom Pelissero. What up, Tom? Long time no talk. Here's his report that the Jets are going to uh, hire former Broncos head coach Nathaniel Hackett as their OC. We know Aaron Rodgers, a huge fan of Hackett's from their three years together in Green Bay. And there was already a ton of speculation about Rodgers potentially landing with the Jets. This is only going to add gasoline to that inferno. So it'll be a fun day for Craig Carton and those boys in New York on the New York sports radio waves. So here's what we know. Quick, my, my quick reaction, Sala has a relationship with Hackett going back to Jacksonville. So yes, everybody's going to connect the dots to attempt to say that it's Rodgers, this is all in an effort for Sala to get Hackett to lure Rodgers. Uh, but maybe they just know each other, Sala and Hackett, and Sala likes the hire. So let's bring in our guy Matt Hamilton on this, because you texted me with the news. To me, when I hear this kind of stuff, and these, I know this is going to be like this storyline that's going to go back and forth, I'm thinking, well, it didn't work last year. Hackett became the head coach of the Broncos with a anticipated top 10 defense with Patrick Sertan and company with an anticipated and projected stud receiving core that would have been perfect for Rodgers to jump ship, leave where he is in Green Bay and go. Now, the Devontae Adams thing was a big part of it later that might have mucked with this a little bit. A year has passed since then, so people's feelings changed. But if it didn't work last year, why would it work now with him as the OC with similar situation in New York in a tough division? That's a great point to bring up. Um, you have to wonder if maybe the way that things played out in Green Bay this year just makes Rodgers a little more likely to want to leave. Um, but you bring up a good point because it's not – you look at it, it is kind of similar. You got some good young receivers that you would have with the Jets, just like the Broncos had. You have a really great defense that they've built up with the Jets, just like the Broncos had. So you're right. It is very similar on the face of it, but yeah, you have to wonder how much Devante played into that hesitancy last year, because, you know, they're still waiting to see what was going to happen with that situation. And as I said, just another year of going through what he went through in green Bay, maybe makes him a little more likely to want to leave, but I'm already seeing pictures getting tweeted out from the Jets and Packers joint practices in 2021 of Rogers standing next to Hackett and Zach Wilson. And it's already, it, New York's already going crazy with this. So Does it it's, it's going to be a fun day. Does, is it the best fit? Is it the best fit for New York? Is it, best for, you know, everyone's saying Derek Carr, there's a lot of other quarterbacks being pegged to take over this role with this uh, unfortunate situation that they have with Zach Wilson on their hands. Is Aaron Rodgers the best fit for New York? That's a great question because, yeah, I mean, with the way he is with the media, that's going to be an interesting relationship. Uh, I think with the way that roster is, though, that, that team's going to be contending right away with what the Jets have built there. I mean, you really look at what they were able to do with a completely with a complete mess of a quarterback situation for most of the year. They were still a game away from going to the playoffs. So uh, you bring Rodgers in there. It's going to be it's going to be an incredible roster and and you got to think they're going to be in contention right away if yeah. they are able to make a move like that. And I think people th believe out there, and I've gotten several tweets about this, that, like, Christian Watson isn't going to have a say in this. Like, nothing he did is going to— And we sort of—we, you and I have put our feet on that, that, like, I do think Christian Watson and the development and the chemistry is going to have a little something to say in Aaron Rodgers going and leaving. And I'm not—I'm even more convinced now— with this Hackett news that, that he is going, when he's weighing his options, it's going to be a whole new room of receivers 
or this guy that, man, like we have a spark. It's hard to develop chemistry and they finally have it. I'm telling you, Christian Watson is going to have a say in this thing in Aaron Rodgers pro cons list. Yeah, absolutely. Because you want to know if he, if he's returning to green Bay, he wants to know that he has guys that he feels confident in, especially guys that he's throwing to that he feels confident in. So I agree with you. That's that's definitely going to be a factor. But he also made it clear in some of the things he said already this offseason that he, he'd like to see the Packers do a little bit more and, and that he doesn't want to necessarily go back uh, if he doesn't feel like they have a chance of winning a championship. So, yeah, uh, it's it's really going to be it's going to be fascinating to see how this all plays out for it's, sure. It's true. Now, Richard Isakow accounted for everything. I Conrad got me a Starbucks coffee. They knew I flew in late from New York to be here in L.A. We got a loaded show. They booked Patrick Queen for me. Patrick Queen, who's take him and Joe Burrow. Do they love each other? Do they hate each other? They know each other really well. So I can't wait to get in his head ahead of this game at Burrow Head this weekend. We've got Eric Weddle coming to coming to face the music on the program. We've got a hammer time from you talking about Patrick Mahomes and that ankle and what that'll look like on the field. But Richard, Richard literally had the, my favorite lighting guy come in here in this makeshift studio. Do you think that he accounted for a swivel chair, though? Uh, I mean, the fact that you have a favorite lighting guy says a lot. Um, I, I, I'm personally excited to see the green shirt tomorrow. We yes. need floating head K. That's what everyone needs, a little floating head K in their life. We also need hammer time. Stay tuned for that. You're going to break down Patrick McCones, what he does with that ankle that is so important, of course, with his improvisational style and his deep ball throwing. Although he looks good out there. He's out there doing those touch-your-toe things without any, any situation or problem. He hopped off that podium knowing everybody's looking at him. Can you imagine being an NFL player, Hamilton, and having to, like, leave the podium and pretend everything's okay? And I would try. <laughs> Mahomes did it perfectly, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, the, the the all the videos coming out yesterday, I just zoomed in on his feet as he's walking and trying to analyze it. It's it's hilarious, but we'll we'll dig into all that in a little bit. I love it. We have other important business to get to. Appreciate you, Hamilton. will be back on in the show. So will the other bearded one, Eric Weddle and Patrick Queen on the show. And we're going to try to get Patrick Queen and Eric Weddle to talk to each other, too, because that's always fun to let the players sort of take over here uh, on Up and Adams. But we have just two shows, guys, two shows Three nights until Conference Championship Sunday, and we are so excited. So let's dig in to these storylines, these players, these coaches, the things that could end up being game changers in these matchups. Last year, last week, I told you, it's Devonta Smith. I'm telling you who these guys are that have the great matchups and the great situations. We're talking to these guys. Boston Scott, stud last week. He'll be on the program tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. But let's go to the NFC and let's break down Niners Eagles. And the thing that I'm looking at most right now is Niners defensive coordinator D'Amico Ryans, okay? He's had a meteoric rise to becoming one of the league's hottest head coaching candidates, right? He leads the Niners to the number one ranked defense in the NFL in just his second season. Take a look at these numbers. This is a dominant group that's led the league in scoring defense, in total defense, and ranked second in forcing turnovers. It is no wonder, no surprise, he's one of those candidates for the Texans and the Broncos gigs. He's so sought after um, that he's been in the position to turn down interviews. He had to cancel with the Colts. The Colts who are saying they want Saturday. Okay, or say, and the Cardinals. He said, sorry, I can't even talk to you. My phone's, I'm putting it on airplane mode. I have to focus on the Niners' playoff run. You know, as if coaching for a chance to the Super Bowl wasn't enough for Ryan's, shutting down this Eagles high-flying offense could be what seals the deal on one of those coaching gigs, right? It's like people are going to be bidding and for his services all across the league. And if, if those aren't enough stakes and enough drama for you, let's add this layer, everybody. All of this is happening in a place where he spent the final four years of his brilliant playing career. How cool is that? Ryans was a defensive leader for the Birds, leading them in tackles twice, helping along young teammates like Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, who, you know, he has to face in the biggest game of his coaching life on Sunday. He'll have his work cut out for him. He's got Jalen Hurts, a, a really complicated, complex Eagles offense that can beat you in a million different ways. But you better believe he's going to present a challenge for Philadelphia, too. Nick Sirianni well aware of that fact, and he was asked about the impact D'Amico Ryans has made on the Niners' defense. Take a listen. They really recognize that that coach cares about them as a person. They really recognize that that coach is genuinely making them better. So, again, am I in there in meetings and hearing how D'Amico Ryans is, is making guys better? No, but I see it that I, obviously that he is doing that, 
and that these guys love to play for him. Okay, I'm not joking. Sirianni went on for like three more minutes on D'Amico. I, I mean, you could literally clip that off, submit it in the next interview, whether it's Colts, Broncos, whatever, Arizona. And who needs references? Play that clip from Sirianni. And on a serious note, seeing that sort of reverence an offensive genius like Sirianni has for a D'Amico Ryans is, means something. It's going to be enthralling to watch the chess match that goes on between these two throughout the game on Sunday. So that's really the thing I'm looking at, that D.C. to really whip something up against this complex Eagles offense. And if Sirianni is able to solve this tough Niners defense, the other thing I'm looking at on the other side is Dallas Goddard. And I thought about this after Gronk brought him up to me yesterday during our interview. Goddard might be the game changer. Tight ends do something. They mean something in these late postseason games. And he put on a show last weekend, okay? He had the one-handed snag. Oh, my God. <sighs> this is the first touchdown. Talk about a tone setter. And they blew out the Giants after this. This is a thing of beauty. And he's been having this type of impact all year. I know, truly, and I feel like the dominance of A.J. Brown, and that storyline just in general, and Devontae Smith, you know, combined with the five games that he missed due to a shoulder injury, that sort of caused Goddard to go fly a little bit under the radar. But look at this. Look at this. Let this sink in for just a second. Only Travis Kelsey averaged more yards per game this year than all Dallas Goddard. DG, we see you here on Up and Adams. Dallas led all non-running backs in reception percentage. Lowest drop rate in the entire league and also led all tight ends in average yards after catch. In fact, in fact, Debo Samuel, people, was the only pass catcher in the entire game to average more yak yards than Dallas Goddard. What? And we should mention the Eagles, 10-0 and in games that Goddard and Hurt start and finish together. Undefeated, 10-zip. So that's what we'll see on the field going up against D'Amico Ryans this weekend. And no all-pro selection, no Pro Bowl. Love for Dallas Goddard, a complete snooze fest around the league. And I know the five games, throw that out the window. Unreal season this guy's put together. Missing those five games and having him on the field, you see the difference he makes when he's out there. And I'm telling you right now, if the Niners defense and, and all of them don't pay close attention to him, he could wreck the game on Sunday. And we've got more to come here on Up and Adams. You saw Hammer. Hammer joins us for Hammer Time. Patrick Mahomes, the ankle. You want to learn something? Hamilton will join you next on this. And Patrick Queen on Joe Burrow. Um, I'm doing good, you know. AFC Championship Week, ready to go. How's the ankle? It's doing good, you know. I've had a few days of treatment, a few days of rehab. Uh, excited to get on the practice field and kind of test it out uh, and uh, see where I'm at. But uh, it's feeling good so far. Patrick did get through that practice yesterday. I'm not even kidding. Cameras were zooming in on his foot as he hopped off. He tried to be real casual, hopping off the podium. There's like two baby steps, and then he walked off, and everybody's eyes were like, shoo, 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 on it. Uh, but he was out there. He was doing that. I mean, those toe taps aren't easy. Uh, every indication he'll be taking the field this Sunday against those Bengals at Arrowhead in the uh, AFC Championship game. But um, with how painful it looked last weekend against the Jets, I'd have to imagine it might still be a factor. So let's bring in Matt Hamilton for another edition of Hammer Time. I tried to get them to take away the swivel chair during the break. I see that that was unsuccessful. Nah, ma, ma. <laughs> you idiots giving me a swivel, a swivel chair. Idiots! Uh, okay, <laughs> Hamilton, you're here. But I can't really, really dance in it because I'm going to go flying. Listen, you're doing a lot of heavy lifting on the show this today. This is my nightmare. This is your nightmare. It's this true. is my nightmare. Okay, but it's, 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 I thought it was going to be the nightmare. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate it. Uh, I thought it was going to be the nightmare for Chiefs fans, seeing what happened. You know, Amanda, my sister, she, was, she, oh, she, yeah. she said, nobody talked to me. I have, Maya has a soccer game, my niece, at three. We can't watch this. And I'm like, watching this happen like, oh, my gosh, somebody's got to tell her. Somebody's got to warn her. And then she came back and she was like, I was watching her go through the emotional ups and downs of this game. But we saw him play through it against the Jags. And while he, you know, still made some huge plays, it impacted the game, Hamilton. If this ankle injury is a little bit lingering, which I imagine it has to be, like Toradol isn't, isn't going to heal this thing unless he's Wolverine from X-Men. How could that ankle affect what we see out of Patrick against Cincy? Yeah, and you talked about it a little bit Monday. I think the fact that it's his right ankle, 
ankle on that plant leg is what's concerning here because that's where you drive off of as a quarterback. That's where you generate a lot of your power is out of that lower body. So um, while he was able to, you know, combat some of that with his arm, pure arm strength in the short passing game, it affected his ability to throw the ball down the field and fit into some tight windows. So let's look at a little bit of tape here and I'll show you what I mean. Let's go. So the first play we're looking at here is a healthy Mahomes against the Rams earlier this season. And what I want you to watch here is that back leg, that right leg. Watch how he's able to drive off of that foot and really push and generate so much power. Ow. Look at all the force that's being generated off that foot. And this is an incredibly high level throw he's gonna make as we run this forward. An absolute laser cover two hole shot to Marquez about this scantling. Rams DB's just throwing up their hands. There's nothing you can do about that. These are the type of special throws he's able to drive in downfield when that ankle's healthy. But this is last weekend against the Jaguars. It's gonna be a very similar type of throw, but look at the difference. He's gingerly stepping forward, not really driving off that yeah. foot. It's really, it just takes kind of a soft step and watch what happens with this throw. The ball just kind of dies on him. It hits the defender in the back, an offensive pass interference call to boot. So that's something I'm going to be looking for. And then there's the more obvious, the mobility factor, the impact that this ankle is going to have on his ability to step up in the pocket. And you see it here. There's a clear lane for him to be able to step up, slide, either scramble or maybe look for Kelsey coming across the middle. We've seen him do this time and time again. He just doesn't really have the confidence to do it. Ends up kind of drifting to his right, not able to escape outside the pocket either, as we've seen him do a million times, and just kind of throws it into the ground, makes the safe throw. So, again, we don't know the exact condition that angle is going to be in. Everybody's going to be speculating. I'm seeing shots of random people at a gym saying that's Mahomes and he's working out and he's fine. We've seen the zoomed up shots on feet. We don't really know what it's going to look like, but if it is a concern, those are the things to look for, yeah. and those are the areas that it's going to impact this game. And if I'm Lou Anarumo, I'm pressing up on these receivers. I'm pressing up on Kelsey. I'm going to try to test him and, and make him. I know it sounds crazy because it's the opposite of what you've always tried to do against Mahomes, but I'm challenging these receivers, and I'm, uh, and I'm testing it early. And to your point, well, he has the arm strength. And you saw what Randy Reed did when Henny came in, and he just like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. So I, I can't be that worried, but Mahomes didn't attempt a single pass over 20 yards in the air in that win over Jacksonville. Not one, you know, but if there is one quarterback and coaching staff that can make it happen, it is them. Listen, great job by Hamilton. Absolutely. We've got Eric Weddle on the show. Eric Weddle here to take his medicine for what he said. And he's a great, and he's a friend of our next guest after this. I can't believe we have Patrick Queen in the building, baby. Let's talk about the Ravens, about the season, about what he's excited about. And we'll be talking about, uh, I need to know, are you friends with Joe Burrow? Or are you not friends with Joe Burrow? Because on the field, it doesn't look like it. Yeah, I live it up. Another big loss, again by Patrick Queen. Patrick Queen sacks Jones. Comes out of one sack, stepped over another, but is hit from the backside and dropped. Patrick Queen. He's so scary, man. First round draft pick by the Baltimore Ravens, one of the most exciting linebackers in the league. Uh, and I must say, a phenomenal Twitter follow. And by the way, Patrick Queen, did you know that you were voted media good guy by your local beat reporters? I did. I did. I didn't know until like I walked in and then they came and told me uh, like a few minutes before it happened and stuff. So it was, it was crazy, but I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, how are you, and why do you think they voted you that? I hear you talk to everybody after the game. I'm good, and I mean, it's just crazy. I, mean, I don't expect to receive a war like that, you know. So um, I remember after the Steelers lost, they came in the locker room, and I was, like, pissed. Did not want to talk to anybody, and they came up, and they were like, can we get an interview with you? And I wanted to say bad, so no, but I'm like, they got a job to do, so I might as well just give them a little insight. Uh, well, we love having you here on the show and for making some time. We miss your Ravens on the field already. Now, you're coming off your best season in Baltimore with career highs, honestly, across the board in almost every category. How would you, like, you're sitting back, you've had a couple days to sort of reflect on the season probably. When you, when you look at it, how do you describe your personal journey this year? Did it feel different from your first two years? Everybody always tells me the game slows down a little bit once you play for a while. Yeah, it definitely slowed down. And uh, I feel like 
I made a great jump, but it was not where I wanted to be. I still wanted to be even better. So uh, that just comes with, I guess, experience. So now that I got the more more experience under my belt, it, year four could be even better. So that's what I'm looking forward to. That's what I'm going to be working for this offseason, just to improve off what I just did. What does better mean to you? Like, is it all pro? Is it, you know, like you got Roquan there now. You and Roquan are a, a nightmare. You're a night. So how much, like, you don't scare quarterbacks around the league now. I want, I want it all. I want it all. Whatever comes with, with it, I want it all. Uh, just at the end of the day, I just want to win, though. But whatever war comes with it, uh, the stats, I want it all. I ain't going to lie to you. I just, I'm greedy like that. Yeah, and, and I'm used to the Ravens having it all. I really am. I'm used to you guys playing deep into these, these postseasons. A lot of energy, a lot of good vibes. There was, you know, a lot of obstacles for this team this year. Big injuries, injuries that, you know, that's that sort of been with the Ravens for the past couple of years. Fourth quarter, weirdness, right? There's quarterback switches, all of that. And the division's really tough. So what's one area of improvement that you do think needs to happen to come out swinging next year? I think we just all got to come in and just come together quicker. I think that was the biggest thing, that we all weren't a true team when we started. So um, that's what the main message was on the exit meetings, was just us coming together quicker, uh, being able to form that bond at a faster pace so that this way when we start the season, things will fall apart like they did early on. Yeah, I love hearing that. We'll talk a little bit more about the Ravens in a bit, but uh, I love—I yeah, I said you're a good Twitter follow. I, I laughed out loud, and so did my whole staff when we saw this. This tweet that you uh, that you put up here, they need to make a show for fans to get on and think that they know football and ask them every single assignment on the field on each play. Now, I would lose immediately in this uh, in this situation, but, but t- what does that show look like? I need you to pick a host. Pick a host. Who's hosting that show? And uh, and what does that look like? For a host, uh, I'll probably say Chuck Clark. Okay, <laughs> I like that. I'll probably say Chuck. <laughs> and it's like these people who are on Twitter telling you what football is about, and and it's that's what it is. Yeah, it's just it's it's crazy because like they'll just like randomly point out something and be totally wrong, like just not even close to what they're trying to say or what they're trying to, the point they're trying to make, and it's just. It don't aggravate me, but it just, like, makes me realize, like, what I do is, like, just another level of what somebody uh, is not capable of knowing, not capable of doing, not trying to down talk anybody. But yeah. there are a lot of fans out there, like, uh, I know one guy that watches um, Bill, Bill's film, uh, Cover One, he knows a lot of stuff about football, and that's because he takes his time to learn it. And he doesn't bash anybody. So uh, it's just, I, I guess it comes with being a fan and then being an athlete. Yeah, well, okay, so what's one thing that you want fans that watch the game to understand? Like, what it, what what bothers you the most that people get wrong the most? Like, besides when you obviously see somebody mess up, like, drop a pick or, like, whatever it may be, like, actually, like, see if you understand what the play was and just before you go bashing somebody. Like, I see people getting bashed all the time, including myself, like, for stuff that has, has nothing to do with them. So that's, that's the biggest point I'm trying to get across. Mm, I love that. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about this weekend. You know this Bengals team. Patrick, better than anyone. You've seen them three times this season. You were college teammates with Joe Burrow and Jamar. I'm, but you got them. I need. You're talking about fans needing to learn. We need to learn. From, look at this interception, people out there watching right now. Are you kidding? First and ten. This is uh, Bengals Baltimore division rival. You, uh, <laughs> Patrick. You don't. I'm showing you this because. I need you to know that I know that you know the secrets and the cheat code. You knew exactly where that ball was going. Talk me through this. Uh, Yeah, I seen Jamar go in motion, and usually when he does that same motion, they don't snap it for the run. They used to run that route concept that they ran, and I was actually supposed to be out a little wider, pushing through with the back, because that was my new number three that I was supposed to push through with. But I knew Jamar going in motion, they was going to throw it to Jamar, so I just hung, hung, hung back a little bit. And I was just like, I'm going to make him check it down if he do throw it out there. And he just threw it straight to me, so he, I guess he didn't see me. I mean, clearly he didn't. You knew where it was going because you know these guys so well. So if you were to give, you know, a, a Professor Patrick Queen lesson to Steve Spagnolo on Burrow ahead of this weekend, what, is, what would you teach him? What would you tell him he needs to know? No explosive, play, no explosive plays. Just make them take the ball down the whole game. Uh, they got great athletes, great wide receiver. Every wide receiver on their team is great. Uh, the running backs could do whatever they want on the field. Uh, so I think the best thing is you, for him to do is just try to get pressure with a four-man rush and just drop back and make them check it down. Uh, I think if you limit those explosive plays, 
made them go the long, hard way. Eventually, something got to give. Are you are you two friends? I know you play together, and he speaks really highly of you at the podium, and you do too. But then on the field, Patrick, it never looks like y'all get get along. What's what? Are you friends? <laughs> yeah, we're friends. I, everybody think we're not friends because we had a fight in college, like every yeah. other college teammates have with each other. So uh, whatever they want to take with that, they can. I just I'm here to say that at the end of the day, if Joe ever needed something from me like I'll be there for him like everybody knows that uh that's how we all are and at the end of the day um when we step on the field he's trying to beat me just like I'm trying to beat him so at the end of the day if we're competing against each other and they look me ugly and nasty then that's football but it matters more right like when you make a play on him because he, yeah it does, it I, I, pay, does. I pay attention to what Joe says a lot and that strip sack I think we have it that strip sack he he hated it he talked about it after the game Patrick first talk me through this uh, yes, yeah, so, so it was just a blitz off the left side, and I was supposed to get through clean, but obviously I didn't. Somebody got bumped out the way, and then I just got running, and, and I saw him sneaking around the edge, trying to make a play, <laughs> and I was just like, I was praying, like, please don't throw it, please don't throw it, please don't throw it. And just went over there and just tried to put a hit on him. Uh, yeah, and it looks like it meant more to you, too. It did. It definitely did. I, <laughs> I was just, like I said, I was running. I was, I was praying, please don't throw it. Yeah. And he, after the game, I remember, he was like, I was mad, I got sick, you never know what's going on. And then I, but then I found out it was Patrick Queen. And he was really <laughs> pissed at you. Yeah, it's different when it's your teammate from college, especially like how we were in college. Uh, it's just the competitive nature between both of us. Uh, nobody want to lose, nobody want to get a play made on them by somebody that they know. Uh, so I guess it comes with being in the AFC North. Yeah, what's your best Joe Burrow story? Uh, I guess him coming in, like, the first day of uh, summer practice, and we had, like, a mini conditioning test. Oh, no, we actually did have the conditioning test. And he came, comes out first day, just lights it up, like, outrunning me, outrunning Devin, trying to, like, prove a point to the team. And so, like, we all sitting there like, yeah, this guy's legit. Like, he had the long hair, calling him Sunshine and stuff. So it was just <laughs> it was an epic story. Did he like being called Sunshine? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. It was it was getting to that point where he was like, I'm done with it. And obviously he cut his hair, so. Oh, my God, that's amazing. I love that he did. I didn't know that story. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your Ravens. Well, I want to ask you about Lamar, but but you and, you and Roquan are really something special. He gets there. Can you sort of describe to someone that I don't want to tweet about it and get it wrong or, like, what I'm seeing. So you tell me, educate me on, like, what – his impact was on you personally, what you two are doing out there and jiving off of each other, because it's really special. Uh, you just, when you watch football, you see him. You see him all over the field. You see him making plays. You see him taking control of games. And uh, once he got there, you just see how he operates, how he's how welcoming he is with everybody, how he learns everybody's name, um, just the way he treats himself as a, uh, as an athlete, how, he be, how he's a pro in the weight room, how he's a pro um getting treatment, whatever it may be, he, he takes a pro uh, approach to it. So just having somebody like that in the room and on, a, on your team is a, a big game changer. And just like, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the, the stuff that he did this season coming in, learning the playbook that quick. Um, just, I'm happy for him getting the money, getting getting a big old bag and stuff. It's just, it, it's everything that he deserves. Yeah, and hopefully it's coming your way then next year with these lofty goals you had. What do you do to make those things happen? So, like, now it's the offseason. Of course, you'll watch the game Sunday, and you'll, you know, low-key, because you can't be because you're a rave, but you'll be happy for your friends doing their thing against against KC. I know that. But what do you personally do? Do you take time off for a little bit and then get back into it? Do you get right into it? Like, how do you handle your business offseason? I think for me, uh, having two offseasons is – the best thing for me was last season. I just took a few weeks off, maybe two, maybe three, and I just got right back into it. Uh, didn't start off extremely hard, but just got back into it slowly and surely. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing, and just eating right. I think I started eating right a little bit too late last season. I mean, last off season. So I think that approach now, just knowing what to eat, what not to eat, and starting to work out early, uh, that's probably the best thing for me to be able to reach those goals. What are you not eating? What are you eating now? What, what do you got to stop? What's like the, the the one thing that you have to stop eating that makes you the most upset? <laughs> pasta. I love pasta. Pasta. All kinds of pasta, yes. You can't eat pasta when? Like just all season? It's just like I love pasta. So like 
instead of like having pasta and like with chicken or shrimp or something in it, I just want pasta. Like I just love pasta and it's too many carbs. So I can't, I can't really eat that. <laughs> so now you got to stop. You got to get it while you can. Um, but there's, there's other kind of pastas now, you know, there's lentil pasta. There's pastas made out. Have you tried any of those? I have not. I haven't even thought about trying none of those. Okay, we won't. We won't even ask <laughs> you to do that. Uh, okay, so so here, I want to ask you. You know, the vibes between you and Roquan, they're on, and they were amazing all season. I mean, before before the trade, it was the twentieth, you know, ranked pass defense. He gets there, you two crush it. It's the second best pass defense. Like you guys were killing it, but the rest of the team, the vibe sort of felt off, and you had the like the. Um, J.K. Dobbins thing happened, and obviously, like, you're rolling out a quarterback that's a third stringer, which is crazy. Um, why why were the vibes off? I'll just ask you, honestly. The thing is, just comes, like, naturally, like, with a football team when injuries happen and stuff happens inside the facility, I think that tends to happen around every football team. Uh, it's just at a point, how well do you respond? Uh, everybody yeah. gets with adversity. And I think the biggest thing was, for us was we just all came together. We all just stuck in there. Um, especially seeing what happened last season and knowing that we have a better chance uh, with more guys being back, even with the injuries, uh, just staying in there, being consistent, having each other's back and just coming in to work and trying to get better and just improve our team, improve our season. Yeah, I have Mark Ingram on my show every week. I have, of course, legend Eric Weddle, former Raven, on my show every week. Chris Carter was on last week. We were talking, Brandon Marshall comes on and talks about this Lamar Jackson thing all of the time. And, you know, the thought that he wouldn't want to play if he was 100%, like, when you hear that kind of stuff, I'm does it just make you so mad? Uh, Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if if you can't play, then that's on you. Um, mm -hmm. Not on you like that, but, like, it's just something that you can't control. I think, at the end of the day, if you could move a little bit, if you could do what you could do um, without sacrificing your whole body and knowing that you and you being out, for longer than what you need to be, uh, go out there and play. Um, no shots at who people think I'm talking about because obviously he couldn't play. Like Lamar's a competitor. He's going to do what he needs to do to get out on the field. If he couldn't play, he couldn't play. Uh, but just overall as a view, but if you're a player and there's something nagging you or something like stopping you from like completely playing, then I understand that. But um, at the end of the day, we're football players. We're not always going to be 100%. So sometimes we just got to, just put up and go out there and ball how we are. It's well said. What do you want to see happen for your guy, Lamar? I want to see him get the bag. I think he deserves it. Um, great guy, great leader, great player, um, just all around a football player. And, um, somebody that our team gels with a lot and loves and would do anything for us. So um, I definitely want to see Lamar stay in Baltimore and get paid and try to go on these Super Bowl runs. Yeah, we want to see that, too. And I know our next guest is going to want to see that as well. I think uh, Eric Weddle wants to say hello. You guys have a mutual love for the Ravens and Wink Martindale, of course. Weddle, get in here. PQ, what's up, babe? What's up, E-Dub? How are you, man? I'm good. You? Uh, doing good. I was I was heartbroken when the, when the Bengals uh, snuck that one out on you guys. But, uh, man, it, it, it was it's great to see your growth and, and you being that impact player that – we all envisioned and playing outstanding football. You and Roquan, best duo in the league, man. It's uh, it's great as a Raven alum to watch you guys play at a high level, which we all expect in, in the standard over the Ravens, man. So I just want to congratulate you on a great season and keep leading them boys, man. Yeah, I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. All right, Patrick Queen, we'll let you go. We appreciate you. Go enjoy, go enjoy a bowl of pasta for breakfast. Go ahead. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna Maybe you try some zucchini noodles at some point, or you don't. Do whatever you need to do. Have some mac and cheese for breakfast. We appreciate you, Patrick Queen. Maybe we'll see you at Super Bowl. And Eric Weddle is here. So we will talk a little Bengals Chiefs. We'll get into the NFC matchup as well. Very excited. Do not go anywhere. I'm sorry to say, they got zero chance to get some bills. Uh, You're, this is a very distressing interview. <laughs> we we tried to be nice. We made they a can't protect Joe. We made they a poster. They got zero <laughs> Okay, they can't, they can't protect them. <laughs> Let's welcome in our good friend, Eric Weddle. Eric, this, this, that clip was very popular. What's your reaction to the reactions? I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't know my opinion really mattered that much to the world. You know, I don't, my week was just like any other week. Uh, <laughs> I'm not on social media, as you guys know, and I don't really watch much TV with my kids. I got high school football, this and that, so... Life is good on my end, and, uh, you know, I've always said a true man can admit when he was wrong, and 
was that boy was i wrong uh, <laughs> on that and uh listen do i take back anything that i said of course not because that's what i believed and and i don't uh you know even the expertise of eric weddle can be wrong and wrong badly so uh Kudos to the Bengals. Uh, I applaud you guys. I was shocked, and I'm not going to lie, of the outcome. Truth be told, I I wasn't able to watch the game live. I was at a charity event for a local high school that I was participating in, and I was with my buddy, and we turned turned off our phones because I was taping the games, and he turned on his phone, and I saw an ESPN headline. It it just said Cincinnati, (laughs) and I said – I knew because they wouldn't say Cincinnati lost. They were saying Cincinnati is advancing or going on. And so then I checked the score and I was shocked. Honestly, I was shocked. Like it's not to discredit uh, the players and the heart and motivation, all that stuff. Like, yeah, we get all that. I just seriously thought like uh, that they, they, you know, if they looked at, what Baltimore did. And then I, th- and I just kept coming back to the Super Bowl and how, you know, they struggled with our pass rush and how we took over that game. And obviously I was wrong and uh, they're moving on and, and they get all the credit. And as they should, the players played outstanding, yeah. the coaching staff uh, out coached them, outplayed them. Burrow, obviously I'm a, a huge fan of his is, is everyone has known from my post, you know, comments before, but mm-hmm. the team stepped up and, you know, Rightfully so. They, they played outstanding. They played outstanding. I don't think it's going to help you with Bengals fans that want to rip your head off when you say that you're so shocked that they won. But you also covered it by saying you were at a charity event at a local high school, so nobody can really come at you when you're doing stuff like that. Well, <laughs> as you as you know, Kay, if if I worried about what other people thought or said about me, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't have played as long as I had Eric, or be who I am. So Eric, we're all I'm, good. I'm seeing this happen on Twitter, and I tweeted during <laughs> during the game. Because it really did, I'm not kidding, it didn't really happen. It happened a little once you said it, but during the game when they were up 14 zip, it was like, it wasn't about, was it bad? It was all just Weddle. I'm not kidding. It was all, the whole fan base was just Weddle, and they were tearing you apart. I get it. No, I I get it. Like, I'm I'm an ex Raven. Uh, You know, we we had our great games, and and you know, deep down, I helped the Rams win a Super Bowl, which they're trying to do. I get it. They yeah. want to be in my spot. I'm a champion. I get it. <laughs> it's all good. Eric, it's all good. I hope they get it. there. Eric, that's not <laughs> it. What it was was, this is the <sighs> truth. Uh, what it was and what I think most fans want an answer to. I defended you in the way of, I, I was writing to people on Twitter or even just tweeting. I said, Eric isn't bothered by this. Like everyone, you got, you all need, like everyone should calm down just because I, I know Eric Weddle and he's not sweating this. Whatever's happening, like, and it, but Definitely it was not. it wasn't that. It wasn't that you picked the Bills, and it wasn't that you're a former Raven. It's that you said no chance, and you, Eric, are like it, you know most. I know you pretty well by now. We're at the end of the season. You know, both teams are paid to win. Anything can happen. So you're usually, and then you came out so hard. For the Bills and against the Bengals, no chance. That's what happened. Why were you so adamant? Yeah. Oh, I gave all those reasons. Yeah. Because they were on their backup O line, and then more multiple O line go down in the previous game against Baltimore. And I saw the second half of that Baltimore game and how that game was in the crosshairs. Like, you know, I and I went on and said, if that play doesn't happen, obviously, what ifs? I don't like to say all that stuff, but Baltimore was right there with them and. Could have easily won that game. And the way their defense was playing in the fourth quarter, I said, I just thought, how in the world does Buffalo statistically have a week to prepare for them? Not going to be able to have the success that Baltimore had. Yeah. And and then I went back to just thinking about the Super Bowl, et cetera, et cetera. And you know what? Hey, that's why. And listen, I was wrong, but I don't care. I know. Right? I'm retired. I'm having fun. I'm coaching high school ball. I can care less <laughs> what happens with the Bengals. Okay, I'm but, sorry. Okay, but but as a former Raven, I, you should feel some sort of way because you, I think, helped the Bengals get the win. I'm not even kidding. Zach Taylor, after the game, goes, I'm scouring the internet for any bit of motivation. Oh, I'm not kidding. DJ Reader came on my show, and he he wants to thank you for what you did. Take Does a look he? at this. Hey. Watch. 
Yeah, I love right. watching you as a kid, especially <laughs> with the no gloves, which is crazy to me. But you can't. Zero chance, bro. You know better than that. Come on, man. Zero. <laughs> come on, dog. We were just back here. What? What you? Uh, why would you even say that to us like that? You, you know those bad takes. You know that's bad locker room talk. You don't even go out like that. You, yeah. you smarter than that. You wouldn't do that as the head coach of your high school. I know that. I would hey, listen. I would if I believed it, and I have no qualms about that. So DJ, I respect your your thoughts, opinions, but at the end of the day, that's what I thought. In, in this great world, we can think and say and do what we want, and when it's we're true. wrong, we admit when we're wrong. And I was wrong. But I move forward, and it's good. So I'm good. They're good. They're playing this weekend. And have a great shot of winning, and should be an amazing game. Yeah. So let's talk about the Bengals and not so much what an old retired has been for motivation. Like oh, if players and, and head coaches are looking the Internet for motivation, I, I think that's completely off base, quite honestly. So oh boy. I, I, I wouldn't really worry about what I'm thinking. I'm worried about what my teammates and – going to be great on Sunday. And I, and I, you know, that's not them. Like, I know they got a great locker room staff, like the defense corner, Louie, like, how is he not for up for a head coaching position? I you don't know? know. Like, I don't know. Seriously. Like they have, they're, they're incredible in the run they're on. So let's not, let's not get into the motivation type stuff. Like you're trying to win a Super Bowl, So no, not trying to prove Eric Weddle wrong. Like seriously. <laughs> Eric, you're, it's kind of funny. I can't tell if funny. we're making this better, if we're making this worse, but I, but I, I do think the motivation played a role. I really do, and not just from you. Well, that's good. But in general, right? So we need to get your pick now. It's you okay. know, it's Patrick Mahomes with the ankle, and then it's, <laughs> and then it, listen. We, just so before you go, we wrote up a little script. I think that I believe in the motivation. If you just want to read the script that we wrote wrote for you, we just switched out the team. Do we have it? <laughs> Can you just say this for us, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, because I don't believe it. <laughs> okay, I'm not gonna say something I don't believe. Fine. Uh, this game, honestly, like the way they played, the way Burrow orchestrated, got the ball out, the plan offensively, the way they ran the football, it was just like poetry in a sense as a football player and as a as as guy that loves the game, and so impressive. So. You know, you go back and forth. Are, is Spagnola going to sit back there and rush for and just play coverage like Buffalo did? I cannot in my right mind see that. He's an aggressive, bring it, attack it type coach. Uh, you know Cincinnati's going to play great defense. It's it's seriously a toss-up. I, I see both sides winning in, in certain ways. And so I brought it. I have a quarter. Okay. <laughs> and here we go. Oh, I'm going to flip it. What is what? Okay, I'll let you pick heads okay. or tails, heads. and whatever it lands on is who I pick. Because really, I think it's a fifty-fifty game. You know, I can see both sides winning. I'm not, you know, Hold do on. I pick Patrick Mahomes? <laughs> Patrick Mahomes is on a high ankle sprain. I know he's out there trotting around like that. It, it's a fifty-fifty game with, with, it, with and the Bengals have won three up against KC, who's never gotten a win over Joe Burrow, and now you got a, a, a mobile quarterback who improvs all the time, who can't plant his right leg. Listen, Katie, this is the AFC Championship. Okay. And, uh, you know, the the Bengals have their strengths. The Chiefs have their strengths. Okay. <laughs> okay. You obviously flip, are a little biased with Bengals fans. <laughs> no. <laughs> you I'm love not. the Bengals. They're in the background. I, okay. I just now noticed that. I didn't know I was going to uh, strike a chord last <laughs> week with my no chance. I should have noticed that. I, I didn't really notice that for the last 17 weeks, but... Okay, uh, flip the coin, legend. Hey, let's go. Let's just Heads. say, let's just look at this real quick. Okay. Let's give oh, it a little amazing. Kobe some love. That is beautiful. I love that hoodie. I'll flip the coin. Okay, heads is Bengals. Heads is Bengals. Win. I'm not even going to look. <laughs> you have to look. I'm picking the Chiefs for motivation for the Bengals. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> you just completely, you just completely <sighs> crapped on motivation and all. I did. I did, did because you know, I don't need, I don't need a coin. I don't need this and that. Bengals, good luck, Chiefs. They're gonna get y'all, yeah. and if not, then I'll come back and say I was wrong again. And and in hindsight, it'll be great for y'all if I'm wrong. So good luck. It's so funny. Okay, Travis, I've got to talk to you about Travis Kelsey because I need to get yes. into your mind here. Okay. 
two touchdowns. He's open, <clears> on, <throat> he's open on every play. NFL record for catches. Impossible to shut him down, question mark. How do you defend him, slow him down, or contain him? Well, it takes it takes everybody. And, you know, that's when I go back and forth with both teams. Like, Chiefs run through Kelsey and shot plays, right? And the Bengals are so sound, and they can match up. If they take Kelsey away, then it then it almost becomes Hardman. Hardman out of the backfield is their next, I think, weapon of choice that they like to get the ball to. The receivers outside are are good, solid players, but are they a Jamar Chase? Are they a T. Higgins? No. And that element that the Bengals have, the Chiefs don't, is something that could sway mm. in the Bengals' favor. But Kelsey is that dominant, and and he's going to beat one on one coverage. Honestly, every third down, I'm doubling him. I'm doubling him and making the ball go somewhere else. In the red zone, I'm doubling him every play. If it's single high and we're bringing five, uh, that post player is doubling Kelsey, and my other guy's got to eat on the outside and, and make plays. So the way Eli Apple is playing Oof. and talking on Twitter, I mean, you got to like that matchup on the edge. So let's you go, Eli. Know, you know exactly what happens on Twitter because you know Eli Apple is on Twitter acting crazy. You, you're you oh, such no, a liar. Have, we got to no, go. No, I have... I have a group text with oh, okay. all my coaches okay, okay, and all my okay. teammates. And of course, mm. of course, I know what's going on with players okay. and whatnot. You know, geez. But we have to go. We have look, to go. Look at the last Quickly. time I tweeted, Kay. When's the last time? I, don't argue go with look. me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm supporting you. Quickly, Two years ago. Quickly, Eagles, Niners, just pick the team. We got to get out of here. You love, Yeah, you love Jalen. You called him your player. You rolled yeah. with him. You were right. Let's see if the Eagles can get him at home. Eric Weddle, you are the best. Thank you for coming on. Let's be great. Have it's fun. Okay. You can go game. subtweet and ghost tweet. I know you have a ghost handle. I know you do. I know you're out there tweeting these bangles. <laughs> my producer just scolded me that they're taking away my swivel chair tomorrow. So I'm going to swivel make myself dizzy while I can. Tomorrow, we have Boston Scott on the show. We'll make some picks as well. Goodbye.